Chapter 2 of Survivor's Tales of Famous Crimes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jules Harlock, Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Chapter 2 Henry Wainwright's Crime Forty years ago, a crime was committed which aroused almost as much interest and excitement throughout the country as the poisonings by Palmer, the Ruggily doctor. This was the murder of a young milliner by Henry Wainwright, a man of considerable standing in Whitechapel Road, London, England. For twelve months, Wainwright's crime was not discovered. Then it was sensationally revealed through the medium of one of his former employees and his own folly. Wainwright was convicted at Central Criminal Court on December 1, 1875. After a nine-day trial before Lord Chief Justice Coleridge, his brother Thomas was found guilty of being accessory after the fact and was sentenced to seven years' penal servitude. Henry Wainwright was hanged at Newgate on December the 21st. Mr. J. M. Steele, whose story is here retold, was one of the witnesses at the trial and was called to prove the pawning and redemption of a wedding ring and keeper which belonged to the murdered woman and was found on her mutilated remains. I became acquainted with Henry Wainwright before I saw him in the dock at the Old Bailey being tried for willful murder. Henry was a fine-looking man on the right side of forty. He weighed about fourteen or fifteen stone and was well-built and jovial, fond of life, and more than usually attractive to women. He was the last man in the world you would suspect of being a murderer. He was a married man with five children. His wife was a most respectable, deserving woman, but that did not prevent him from carrying on with other women, a weakness which in the end sent him to the gallows. Henry's conduct made him very hard up, through him, indeed, into bankruptcy and one day there was a fire at number 84. A relative of mine hurried to the rescue, got a ladder, ran up into the upper rooms and saved some books, the very things that Henry did not want to preserve, for they gave clear evidence of his position and showed that he mediated arson, a crime of which he would, no doubt, have been found guilty if he had not been convicted for murder. That is how I first got to know Henry Wainwright. We became on speaking terms and occasionally spent a little time together. And very good company he was too, full of cheerful conversation and always ready with a laugh and a joke. Little did I imagine then that he had committed a murder so dreadful that the revelation of it filled the country with horror. Nobody suspected him of the conduct of which he was undoubtedly guilty. He was highly esteemed in his own circle and was, I believe, a great chapel goer. In those days, Whitechapel Road, in the neighborhood of London Hospital, where Henry lived and did his business, was a very different from what it is now, though many of the old houses are standing, and the premises on which the murder was committed are in existence, but altered and renumbered. Life went more easily then, and there was not the rush that reigns today. A man like Henry Wainwright could have made a great deal of money comfortably if he had stuck to his business and gone straight. At that time I was 27 years old and a manager to a pawnbroker in a large way of business in Commercial Road. Mr. W. Decker. Those were the days when sailing ships with famous names came home from long voyages, 
and men would hurry ashore with large sums of money, hard-earned, which they would recklessly squander. I have known a sailor come ashore with sixty pounds and not have a halfpenny left next day. The girls and the harpies had got it all. Many were the strange things that were brought to me to pawn, evidences of folly in, on the part of men who so easily fell victim to those who battened on them when they were ashore. Few things are particularly noticed when they are pawned or redeemed, and certainly a busy man does not pay attention to such commonplace objects as rings. So I cannot say that I showed undue interest in a wedding ring and a keeper, which were pledged on May 20th, 1874. In the name of Anne King, of 3 Sidley Square, Yet that transaction became very material later on, when Henry Wainwright, who had called himself Percy King, was being tried for the murder of Harriet Lane, who was known as Anne King, his supposed wife. I had good reason to make myself well acquainted with the pawning episode and all the details of the crime, because from first to last of it I had spent seventeen days and a very weary most of them were, in and about the courts. We observed at the time a custom, which was duly followed in this case, to the effect that when a man or a woman wished to pledge anything and refused to give a Christian name, we provided one. In this instance, the rings were offered in the name of king. No Christian name was being given, and we accordingly recorded the transaction in the name of Anne. It was always Anne for a woman and John for a man. This wedding ring and keeper were pawned, then, in the name of Anne King. The transaction in itself was too small and commonplace to be remembered by me, and I gave no thought to it until September 1875 when a horrible discovery was made in the most extraordinary fashion. A woman's mutilated remains were found in the possession of Henry Wainwright. A very brief examination showed that the remains had been recently severed with some weapon as a chopper, and that the woman had been murdered and dead a long time. Wainwright and a girl named Alice Day were arrested, and later on Thomas Wainwright, a married man, was taken into custody. Bit by bit through the inquest, the magistrate's inquiry, and the trial at the Central Criminal Court, the whole ter terrible story was told, and as I was associated with the affair from start to finish, I will tell you what it all amounted to and how the mystery developed. Harriet Louisa Lane was a young milliner who had served her apprenticeship at Waltham Cross and gone to Whitechapel about the end of 1870. She fell in with Henry Wainwright with the result that a child was born. Henry was at that time in business with Thomas and matters were far from flourishing. The association with the girl was kept up and again she expected to become a mother. She and Henry were passing as man and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Percy King, and there is no doubt that as she did not make any attempt to work at her ordinary business and threw herself entirely on Wainwright, she was a very great and growing burden. Henry had to find new lodgings for Harriet, and he got them at Mrs. Foster's, 3 Sydney Square, very near the spot where there was such a tremendous commotion with anarchists a few years ago. He took Harriet and the two children and a woman who, he said, was a nurse and arranged for them all to live in the house. He explained that, as he was a traveler, he would be away a good deal and would not see much of his family. As a matter of fact, he was then conducting his business a few hundred yards away and was living in Tregedar Square, quite near, with his real wife and children. 
the so-called nurse was a miss wilmore who had been a fellow apprentice with harriet and had gone to live at sydney square and to help look after the children on agreed terms henry never visited sydney square after leaving harriet and the children there he was getting deeper and deeper into the mire he became a bankrupt his liabilities being more than three thousand pounds apart from a considerable sum which he owed another brother named william he was being harassed all around and as he was not able to clear off a mortgage he got into heavy difficulties regarding number 215 Whitechapel Road. Meanwhile, Harriet needed money very badly, and she was determined to have it from the man who had ruined her. But he could not always find money to give her, and she was reduced to such desperate straits that she pawned almost everything she possessed, even to her linen. The first thing she seemed to have pawned was the wedding ring, which she bought to me the fact that henry was far from being niggardly is shown by his contributions to harriet's maintenance for while he couldn't afford to do so he allowed her five pounds a week though he had the heavy expenses connected with his own wife and five children to meet but the time was rapidly approaching when henry could not give harriet money at all and accordingly she made her way to one of his shops and was very violent and disagreeable. Wainwright tried to pacify her by sending money by his manager, but she was not easily satisfied, and once, when two pounds had been offered, she scornfully threw it on the floor, saying that it was only enough to pay the rent which was owing. Altogether, Harriet went to the shop about twenty times, and on one occasion at least Henry got so desperate that he threatened to murder her. The squalid climate came one night when Harriet went back to Sydney Square, the worst for drink, and created a disturbance in the street which so badly upset her that Miss Wilmore had to sit up all night with her. The landlady gave Harriet notice to quit, but as the poor girl had nothing with which to pay for rent, she was allowed to remain two days longer. By that time, Henry had managed. I do not know how, but it must have been a desperate business to scrape together fifteen pounds, and this he gave to Harriet, who at once paid her rent and debts, and for whom Miss Wilmore got things out of pawn. Harriet made herself smart and attractive. Things seemed to be better now. Sydney Square was to be left, and a new start made at Stratford, where Mrs. Wilmore was to live with the children. On a Friday afternoon, it was September the 10th, Harriet Lane left Sydney Square, carrying only a nightdress in a parcel. She was in good health and spirits, and there was not the slightest reason for supposing that she meant to do mischief to herself. But from that time, she was never again seen alive, except by Wainwright. He lured her into number 215, shot her and cut her throat, and buried her in the grave in the floor which he had already dug for her. For a whole year, an exact year to the day, I believe the body remained in its awful resting place, and Wainwright went about his daily duties more or less as if nothing had happened. Miss Wilmore became alarmed and troubled because of the absence of her friend, and she went to number 84 and asked Wainwright what had become of Harriet. Henry was quite prepared with an explanation and said that Harriet had gone to Brighton. But, said Miss Wilmore, how could Mrs. King possibly have gone to Brighton when her sole luggage was only a nightdress? Oh, Wainwright told her, Harriet was all right because he had given her money with which to buy clothes. With that explanation, Miss Wilmore had to be satisfied. Following it came in due course a letter from a man who called himself Frikey, who had more than once visited Harriet in Sydney Square. 
The letter said that Frikey and Harriet were going to the continent together, that she was making a fresh start in life and was severing her connections with all her old friends. It turned out that Frikey was none other than Thomas Wainwright, who was already trying to shield his brother from the consequences of the terrible crime which he had committed. Things were swiftly going from bad to worse with Henry. He was forced to give up possession of number 215 and take a position as a manager with a Mr. Martin. This meant that number 215 was put in the possession of caretakers, and consequently there was the ever-present risk of the awful secret being revealed. Henry must have known, despite all his care and cunning, that his crime would be discovered when the decomposing body in the grave made its presence known. People were in possession of the premises, and it seemed as if he would never have the chance to try and take away and destroy the evidence of his guilt. But it happened that number 215 became temporarily uncared for and instantly Henry took steps to carry out a purpose which he must have had in mind for a long time. With the help of Thomas, he bought a spade, a chopper, and some American cloth, and set to work to remove from the grave the body he had concealed a year before. The body, as it happened, had been buried in chloride of lime instead of quicklime, and this had brought about the very result that the murderer desired to avoid, for, instead of destroying the body, it had preserved it. So far, Wainwright had acted cunningly and cautiously. That is shown by his successful concealment of his crime for a whole year. But now he did a thing which a moment's thought would have shown him was equal to putting the rope around his neck. He actually asked a man named Stokes, his former foreman, to go with him to number 215 and help to carry two parcels to the borough, parcels which were made up of the remains of the murdered woman. On Saturday afternoon, September the 12th, Wainwright and Stokes went to the back of number 215, through the yard which is still there, and entered the warehouse which was about 80 feet long. At Wainwright's request, Stokes went upstairs for the parcels. Then Wainwright called out and said, Oh, they're here, under some straw, where I put them a fortnight ago. This was said, doubtless, to prepare Stokes for anything unpleasant which he might notice. Stokes returned to the warehouse and noticed the chopper, which had some very disagreeable matter on it, Wainwright readily gave an explanation of the state of the implement, which he wrapped up in paper and put aside. Then he asked Stokes to take up the parcels. Stokes began to lift them, but said that they were very heavy and very disagreeable. By that time, Wainwright must have seen that the game was up, but he never faltered in his determination to see the dreadful business through. He told Stokes that he would help him, and taking up the lighter of the two parcels, they left the warehouse and walked as far as Whitechapel Church. Then Stokes declared that he must rest, and he put his parcel down. So did Wainwright, saying that he would fetch a cab and telling Stokes to wait until he returned. As soon as Wainwright had gone, Stokes, full of suspicion and a terrible curiosity, hastily unfastened the American cloth, and to his horror found a decomposed human head and a severed hand. He instantly retied the parcel, and with astonishing presence of mind, gave no sign. When Wainwright came back with a cab five minutes later, of having made such a ghastly discovery, the two parcels were put into the cab, a four-wheeler, then Wainwright told Stokes to go home, and he would see him at seven o'clock. But Stokes had learned far too much to be able to leave the matter, and he resolved to carry it through to the very end. There is little doubt that his action sent the murderer to the scaffold. 
Wainwright drove off, and instantly Stokes started in pursuit, beginning one of the most amazing chases that ever took place in the London streets. Wainwright's intention was to go to bur the borough, but he ordered the cabman to drive in the opposite direction, and after traveling some distance, with Stokes in pursuit, he stopped and took up a girl named Alice Day, a ballet dancer. Then the cab turned around and began to go towards London Bridge. Wainwright told the driver to go over the bridge and continue till he was told to stop. From beyond the London Hospital to the other side of London Bridge is a long distance for a man to run, and the roads and pavements were much more difficult to cover forty years ago than they are today. Stokes hurried after the cab, fearful of losing sight of it, and he soon began to feel exhausted. He pantingly begged two policemen to stop the cab, telling them that there was something badly wrong. But, incredible as it seems, they laughed at him and told him he was mad. Away the cab went, Stokes gamely following until he was over London Bridge. Then, not far from the end of the bridge, in High Street, he saw the cab stop and Wainwright get out with one of his awful parcels. Wainwright was making towards an empty place of business called Hen and Chickens which his brother Thomas had occupied, and in the cellar of which there was a great mound of earth in which, doubtless, Henry meant to bury the remains once for all. Two policemen were near, and again Stokes called for help. He told them that something was wrong and begged them to take action. This time Stokes did not appeal in vain. Wainwright had gone, got one parcel into the hen and chicken, and was carrying the other from the cab when one of the policemen went up and said, What have you got in that parcel? How Wainwright's soul must have sunk, how his heart must almost have stopped beating, what terrible emotions must have surged through his guilty mind. Yet he was bold enough to answer, What business is it of yours? Why do you interfere with me? It was no good. The other policemen had now come up, and they entered the hen and chickens and began to open the first parcel. Then Wainwright's fortitude forsook him. He begged the constables, for God's sakes, not to tamper with the parcel. He offered them twenty pounds, if they would let him go, then said he would make it two hundred pounds, but the men had opened the parcels and had seen the dreadful nature of the contents. The policeman told Wainwright that he must go with them, and, with Alice Day and the parcels, the cab went to the nearest police station. An examination showed that the parcels contained the remains, in ten portions, of the body of a woman. No time was lost in going to the Whitechapel warehouse and examining the place. Then it was seen that part of the floor at the back was raised and that the boards and joists had been sawn away, making a shallow grave about five feet long and three feet wide. There was abundant trace of chloride of lime and a chopper and spade were found, as well as fragments of human remains. Wainwright had taken the body out of the resting place on the previous day and with the chopper had rudely hacked it to pieces. He had then tied up the portions in the American cloth. When asked to explain how the remains came into his possession, Wainwright told a clumsy lie. He said that they had been given to him to take to the hen and chickens by a Mr. Martin, who had promised him five pounds for the job. That tale was easily proved to be false, and it was very soon seen that the girl Alice Day knew nothing about the crime, and she was discharged after being brought before the magistrate. She declared in court that though she had been on friendly terms with Wainwright, there had been nothing further between them. The next development, when Henry had appeared in the police court, was the arrest of Thomas Wainwright at his 
address at Fulham, and finally the two brothers who had such splendid chances of making a good thing out of their business stood in the dock of at the old bailey financially ruined to take their trial for a crime that was to send one of them to a shameful death day after day the horrible court was packed by people who ranged in rank from a duchess downward for the case had aroused intense and unusual interest in those days i was very much like stokes in appearance and often enough when we left the court we were followed by great crowds of people more than once we made them laugh by such simple tricks as exchanging hats we were pretty cheerful and passed a good deal of of our time while waiting to be called in playing cards and drafts and dominoes in going to the police court trial the witnesses used to pass through rows of policemen so great was the pressure of the people who were eager to get a glimpse of anybody connected to the case henry did not strike me as being very much upset at the prospect of, of the verdict of guilty i well remember how he laughed when i was recalled after giving my evidence i had told about the pawning of the wedding ring and keeper and henry's counsel tried to discredit my evidence because of the use of the christian name of anne the lord chief justice wished to see the original pawn tickets and so i fetched them from commercial road they were on a long file about five feet in length and when i got back into the witness box i began quickly to pull the tickets about to find what i wanted good gracious explained the lord chief justice i thought it was a snake everybody in the court laughed and henry and thomas laughed as loudly as anybody particularly henry pretty nearly everything came out in evidence but not the real details of the murder for only henry could give those but it was clear that what had happened was this henry decoyed harriet into the lonely warehouse shot her in the head from behind with a revolver fired two more shots and then cut her throat stripped her and buried her in a grave which he had made in the floor he burned the clothing in a neighboring grate but left the rings on her fingers three shots were heard by some men who were working near and one of them ran out but it was thought that the sounds came from firing by a man who was known to practice with a double-barreled gun, and no further heed was paid to the matter. How perilously near was Henry to being caught as a red-handed murderer? What would have happened if the men had actually burst into the warehouse? Would he have shot them also, or turned the weapon on himself? Who can tell? There was no difficulty in proving the possession of the revolver, because Henry had kept one in his desk at number 84, and he had tried to pawn it, but he had taken it away because he could not get the advance he asked for, fifty shillings. There was one fact which was never made public, and it was this, that the night before the murder, Harriet told her landlady that Henry had threatened to shoot her but no circumstance of that sort was needed to satisfy the jury about the prisoner's guilt. They were absent for less than an hour. Then they went back into court, and Henry was sentenced to death and Thomas to penal servitude for seven years. Henry was hanged four days before Christmas, and it is told of him that the night before his execution he smoked a cigar and boasted of his victories over women. Certainly, in the dock, though he denied the murder, he confessed that he had been wickedly immoral. A great deal of sympathy was shown, and rightly, for Henry's poor suffering wife and the helpless innocent children, and a fund of more than twelve hundred pounds was raised to help them. I do not know what happened to Thomas when he came out of penal servitude, but I believe that he had something to do with a public house. Neither do I know what has happened to the other witnesses who were called at the trial. 
Stokes, I believe, went into business on his own account, helped to some extent by a special grant of thirty pounds which the Lord Chief Justice made to him for his uncommon effort in making the murder known to the police and sending Henry Wainwright to the gallows. End of chapter 2, Henry Wainwright's Crime